god, the song is so good. Okay, I'm gonna pause it now. Uh, hi everybody! Welcome to episode two, part two of Andake Understood from Professor Chang's tabletop workshop. Uh, welcome to college. Class is in session now, I suppose. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone who is watching. Today has been a very weird day for me. It's been very dreary here in my neck of the woods. Um, I feel kind of depressed because of that. It's been really rainy. I feel very bored and listless. So hopefully this stream will help kick things back into the way they're supposed to be. I'm also going to move my little mic a bit closer. Uh, so yeah, let's get let's get started without further preamble. Uh, first of all, who am I? Uh, my name is Connie. My pronouns are the he and she. I am the uh, GM, the game master on Transplaner RPG, as well as the executive producer. Uh, what is Transplaner RPG? It is a all trans, uh, person of color led, 100% homebrew D&D 5th edition campaign set in a non-colonial and anti-orientalist world of my own design called Andake. As you can tell on the map, uh, we covered the terms non-colonial and anti-orientalist last night. The VOD should be up on our Twitch for full viewing, and we will hopefully have that up on to, uh, YouTube very soon. Uh, so this particular episode is meant to build off of the ideas we've already introduced yesterday. But if this is your first time hopping in, that's totally fine too. I hope you will get something out of it. So what is what is Andake Understood? What is Professor Zhang's Tabletop Workshop? Um, let's start with the second one. Professor Zhang's Tabletop Workshop is sort of my little space online where I give GM tips, you know, advice about building NPCs, advice about role-playing and, you know, integrating improv techniques into how you uh, build your characters and how you run your sessions, uh, as well as like how to homebrew and balance uh, fifth edition mechanics uh, with the intention of building your own system down the line. Because if you're, you know, like a super intense GM, you've probably thought about building your own game or at least using your own house rules, expanding upon them somewhat. What is Andake Understood? This is a special five-part series underneath Professor Chang's Tabletop Workshop, where I will specifically talk about my homebrew world of Andake uh, and use examples within this world to sort of uh, highlight my methodology and my philosophy toward homebrewing and world building. As a person, I am interested in horror as a genre. Uh, I am interested in monstrosity as a concept, and I love snails. This is a newfound love of mine but I do love snails. <laughs> uh, great, so let's get into it. Some announcements. The next lecture, part three, will be tomorrow, Wednesday, July 15th at 5 p.m. Central on Twitch, same time, same place. The topic will be revealed uh, in the coming days, so keep your eyes peeled on our Twitter, uh, Transplanar RPG, or you can follow me on Twitter by Connie Chong or on Tumblr, D and Daddy Issues. Um, that's where I post a lot of my updates about various things. You can also follow Transplanar RPG on Tumblr at the same name, Transplanar RPG on Tumblr.com, as well as Instagram and YouTube. Uh, and after this five-part series ends on Friday, Professor Chong's will air every other Saturday at 3 p.m. Central or on the weekends that our main campaign doesn't stream. Uh, oh, thank you so much for following. Uh, that makes me think of the next thing I want to talk about, which is if you want to follow, if you want to donate for some reason, go ahead, you know. Every contribution to follow is loved and very deeply appreciated, but please feel no pressure to do either of those things. So without further ado, let's get farted. Uh, <laughs> so today our lecture topic is the old guard disrupting white histories. What the heck does that mean? Uh, basically in this lecture I'm going to be talking about what I call a triptych of Andakin powers, the Kingdom of Tulong, the United Tribes of Jukai, and the Republic of Talmud. And together, these three powers can be considered the Old Guard of Andake. Uh, but the Old Guard isn't just about Tulong, Jukai, and Talmud. I'm also using this term in its more general sense, uh, the idea that for the longest time, Dungeons and Dragons and other tabletop roleplay games has primarily been gatekept and controlled by cis, white, straight dudes and their stories. Uh, as an aside, I think it's pretty funny how it's like the same dudes who howl about being gatekept, but they're the ones doing the gatekeeping. 
I feel like it's like racist project projection on a massive scale. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to move on. Uh, so that's what you can expect from today's lecture. You can also expect me to discuss each of the three old guard and Dokken powers in detail. So like the gods they worship, uh, their culture, their government, their language, and whatever notable geographical landmarks reside within or near their borders. Uh, in addition to that, you can expect me to discuss my own design philosophy that goes into creating these uh, powers. I say creating and not having created because I'm still working on each and every one of these powers. Um, my campaign world is very much an evolving document as reflected in the one sheet I have handed to my players. It's a Google Doc that I continue to update as players learn more about the world. Um, this takes the pressure off of me to know everything about the time as a GM, right? And it also opens up the world to be changed when we make mistakes or acquire new information. Finally, uh, you can expect me to discuss strategies for creating countries of your own that attempt to resist these more normative ways of looking at each other and looking at ourselves. Uh, these are the ways we discussed yesterday uh, in envisioning non-colonial anti-orientalist worlds. And like I mentioned earlier, this lecture seeks to expand upon the fundamentals I already established last night, utilizing my homebrew world of Andake as a jumping off point. Um, I hope that what I talk about tonight will be useful to you in some way as a writer, as a creator, as a storyteller, as a GM, or maybe even as a player. So let's get started. Uh, let's discuss, first of all, the term the old guard. Why do I call this triptych of powers the old guard? Um, triptych, if you don't know, is like a trio. I, I use it in the sense of a, tri a, a group of, of three. Um, the Old Guard in Ndake is a trio of powers comprised of, like I mentioned earlier, the Kingdom of Tulong, the Republic of Talmud, and the United Tribes of Jukai. You can find them on that map, do a little Where's Waldo thing. Um, so the first thing that you want to understand about Ndake's geographical and socio-political landscape is that it's an extremely diverse world. You can probably tell from the map already. There's everything from frozen tundras to like boiling jungles to arid badlands. And just like the physical world of Ndake, the spheres of power are constantly battling against each other for dominance, which leads us to our topic today, Tulong, Talmud, and Jukai. Um, I think it's actually really funny that I'm calling this triptych of powers the old guard, because that's exactly who I'm basically giving two fat middle fingers to with my construction of these, these uh, powers. I am referring, of course, to the actual old guard of Dungeons and Dragons that created such lovely source books as Oriental Adventures, uh, which if you don't know, this is a two-part rulebook for AD&D, or Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, that was published, I think, in the mid-1980s, um, that first of all was called Oriental Adventures, uh, and second of all was written almost exclusively by white dudes, fantasizing about a mythical Far East. Um, Oriental Adventures has a lot of problems, and the Asians Represent podcast, if you don't know what that is, check them out on Twitch and on YouTube. They have a fantastic series called Asians Read dot 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 Oriental Adventures that sort of picks apart the source books on such a granular sentence level that I'm not even going to attempt to replicate here. Basically, long story short, one of the central problems of Oriental Adventures is that it basically self-describes itself as a mashup of China, Japan, Korea, and Mongolia, which are, first of all, four extremely different countries uh, that are each extremely diverse, has their own cultures, peoples, histories, and conflicts. And, you know, this, these source books sort of reduce these four into a single Oriental adventure. Right. Um, I honestly think that OA is sort of the shorthand. It's kind of a masterclass in what not to do when you're trying to portray frequently orientalized cultures. I mean, oriental is in the actual name of the source book. The jokes basically write themselves. Um, a offshoot that sort of branches off of this discussion. Did Gygax and his retinue do research on these source books? Did they do research on samurai, yakuza, martial arts, you know, the various beasts, you know, nagas, etc., cetera, uh, that appear within them? Yeah, they did. They actually did a lot of research, uh, which I think goes to prove the point that research itself is not enough. Um, how you apply and execute that research matters just as much uh, as doing the research itself. 
Honestly, if not more. Uh, so how did Gygax and his crew execute that research? They mashed the Far East into a single cohesive campaign setting spread across two source books, which is, okay. Uh, I got a question last lecture, a really good question, by the way, um, asking how much research into cultures that don't belong to you or that you're not familiar with is enough when you're trying to turn them into a fantasy setting of your own. And this, this is part of the reason why I think this question, again, which is a good one and well-intentioned, cannot be where your engagement with your discomfort and your ignorance stops. Um, and this goes for me too. I am not exempt from this, right? Research is good and necessary, but just because you do it, do it doesn't mean you can't fuck up. And I think it's important to always be aware of that. Uh, so Tiu Long, Talmad, and Jukai, which are based respectively uh, and loosely off of dynastic China, medieval India, plus the Roman Republic, and post-Sengoku era Japan, are sort of my attempt at a response not only to oriental adventures, but at all of the normative portrayals of the quote-unquote Orient. Uh, you'll notice right off the bat uh, that a major difference in how I'm framing my creative inspirations versus how Gygax and his team frames theirs is that I'm going on a country-by-country -country basis, right? I'm not smashing four different countries with their own unique histories uh, together into one big fucked-up Orientalist potluck that I get to pick and choose the parts I like, right? Or that I think are interesting. Um, you know, honestly, I wish I went even further when I was first building, you know, my world. I wish I got even more specific with my inspirations when I first started making Tulong, Talmud, Jukai, and the rest of Endake. I wish I focused on one specific province, one specific people, one specific culture for each of them, because then, A, I'd be able to refine my research and really dig into what I have instead of being overwhelmed, right, by the huge variety of options out there. And B, you know, I'd be able to deepen my themes in a way that a wide breath just cannot give you. Uh, and here's, here's a piece of screenwriting and just general writing advice that I think really behooves any world builder, which is specific beats general. Uh, get as fucking specific as you can when you're building your world and your NPCs, you know, both in what inspires you and in what you end up producing, because it's those specific details, those sensory descriptions and unique mythologies that your players are going to latch onto on a session to session basis. So if I could redo all of this from the beginning, that's probably what I would change differently. Fuck, I might even base all of Andaki off of just China and like have it be the various provinces or pick like five different provinces and like one specific time era to focus on. But I'm not gonna get too ahead of myself. That's an interesting thought exercise for the future. Let's dive in. Uh, the first, but before, before we do, I'm gonna do my classic water break. This is a really great water bottle, by the way. Has this little cuppy thing that prevents me from spilling the water because I always do that, especially cups with wide brims. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, moving it uh, to the topic of the Kingdom of Tulong. So, as I mentioned earlier, the Kingdom of Tulong is that big sort of uh, region, kind of in the central southern area of the main continent, with that little little peninsula thing sticking out. Um, Tulong is essentially loosely based off of dynastic China. Uh, I think this is pretty obvious in the name and also in a lot of the culture and geography that I'm gonna jump right into. Uh, so let me pull up my little too long reference sheet here that I have in my Google Doc. Uh, very quick, just by the books, beats of what's important about too long is this. Uh, the people of too long worship Mengshen Zhidi, who is the god of knowledge and dreams. Uh, Tiu Long is split, as you can sort of tell, kind of, uh, by the massive Bian River and is home to the Silent Grove, it's that little cross-hatching of trees, to its northwest. The kingdom is ruled currently by a person called Emperor Zhen of Xiong, and the capital is at Dokao, which is where that little, that X, where that X is. So I'm gonna dive deeper into each of these details to give you more, more of a, of a, of a nice uh, specific overview of Tiu Long. Let me pull that up here. Okay, so 
the power, as I mentioned before, is the kingdom of Tulong that venerates Meng Shenzhi Di. Tulong is an intensely diverse kingdom whose territory is sort of growing by the day, thanks to Emperor uh, Zhen's aggressive kind of military and economic campaigns that she is waging right now. Their god, as I mentioned earlier, is a deity called Meng Shenzhi Di. Meng Shenzhi Di has dominion over the realm of dreams, of prophecy, right, and of knowledge, and followers of Meng Shenzhi Di value intelligence, oration, you know, so a lot of bards venerate Meng Shen, uh, and above all, the skill of dream interpretation, which in the eyes of Meng Shen's uh, worshippers perfectly unites their god's primary domains of knowledge and dreams. So uh, the constellation of Meng Shen Zhi Di resembles kind of an unfurled scroll. Uh, if you missed yesterday's lecture, stars and constellations are very important. They're sort of the, seen as the physical embodiment of gods in Andake. Uh, the capital of Tulong is at Dokao, uh, which is hemmed in by forested foothills, you know, and the low, sprawling, densely populated city itself is easily one of the largest cities in the kingdom and of course the world the outskirts of the city are sort of comprised of prized you know rice paddies tea harvests that sort of bloom on the steep inclines of the foothills and dokao itself is organized on a circular grid <clears throat> bossing say a little bit uh the emperor of tulong lives inside the slumbering city, which is a magnificent sort of sprawling palatial complex in the heart of Dokao that's strictly guarded by an elite fleet of royal soldiers during all hours of the day. <clears throat> Definitely my nod to the Forbidden Palace. Uh, no outsiders are allowed inside the slumbering city without a writ from the emperor herself, uh, even if they are accompanied by one of her officials or her consorts. The aesthetic, you know, the primary aesthetics here of Too Long, I really wanted to hammer home farmers, right, being the common folk, but also scholars and, and uh, artisans and artists. It's, you know, like I mentioned earlier, it's difficult to gen generalize Tulongans as anything other than varied, because not only is the geography, but the cultures are very diverse. Um, so there aren't, you know, but I, I wouldn't say there aren't any stereotypes about people who are from Tulong. There, like I mentioned earlier, there's a very high number of uh, agrarian folk, peasants, you know, farmers. Um, and, you know, save for a few technologically intrepid cities, a lot, you know, of the geography is fairly agricultural, agriculturally based. Um, however, there are a lot of famous scholars, mathematicians, philosophers, writers, craftspeople, bards, you know, alchemists even, who commonly hail from too long, and there is no lack of coin flowing from the capital for endeavors in the arts, humanities, and science, uh, so long as they serve the kingdom's interests to some degree. Uh, the culture, the culture here of Tulong uh, is based around dreams, and to a certain degree, especially if you're from the capital or a major city, examinations, court examinations, which of course I modeled off of uh, Imperial China's actual court examinations, which I think are a really interesting system, which is why I wanted to reflect that in my own world building. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about dream interpretation. Dream interpretation in too long is seen both as an innate talent, something you're born with, like some people are just born good at singing, they just have good voices, right? Um, but this is also seen as a cultivated skill one that is actually crucial to the successful operations of the kingdom. So those with a knack for interpreting other people's dreams are called dream touched or even prophets, right? But the specific title dream blessed belongs to the emperor alone. And once a year, the all important imperial examinations occur. This is a standardized, standardized test I know, I'm getting flashbacks to the SATs already. Uh, it's open to anyone, anyone in Tulong, who can afford the entrance fee, of course, and procure a recommendation from a court official. The test itself is extremely rigorous, very lengthy, and it covers a broad and deep range of topics, uh, including arithmetic, history, philosophy, magics, you know, politics, physics, literature, um, but most importantly, dream divination examinees have been known to sort of like vomit, cry, or even pass out from the stress. This is also my nod to like exam culture, right? Uh, that's very, very common, I think, in a lot of like 
specifically Chinese American communities, um, and the rare few who pass the exam are placed within the slumbering city as sort of low-ranking officials where they can begin to make their mark on the kingdom and make the changes they want to see changed or keep the traditions alive that they want to see keep kept alive. Um, and both civilian and military officials are required to take and pass the exam. Uh, the government itself, as I mentioned, is uh, based off of dynastic China, which means that, yeah, the government of Tulong is a dynastic monarchy uh, with a long and very contested history. At the start of the camp campaign right now, the name of the dynasty that rules, rules Tulong is known as the Xiong dynasty. Uh, uh, the current ruler, as I mentioned earlier, is a woman called Emperor Zhen. Uh, her full title is Emperor Zhen of Xiong, Her Imperial Majesty, Daughter of Heaven, Lord of Ten Thousand Years, The Dream Blessed. Uh, and her word is her word is law. Uh, operating directly underneath her is the complex sort of multifaceted bureaucracy of the central government, which is split into two primary categories, civilian affairs and military affairs. The highest office in both categories is known as the counselor in chief, who sort of oversees the day-to-day -day operations of their respective groups. Uh, and running parallel to this central government is a less structured, but still vital system of like court advisors, magicians, alchemists, consorts, uh, but most importantly of all, dream interpreters, also known as prophets. I'm going to pause here for a second and talk a little bit more about consorts. I actually just, uh, I'm reading, like, I'm expanding off of the one sheet that I gave my players at the start of the campaign, and I just caught a typo, a mistake, and I want to pause and uh, talk about it. The mistake that I caught that I forgot to write out and replace with consort was concubine. Um, and this is a way I've, I've been checking myself when I've been making the Kingdom of Too Long Originally, the consorts of Emperor Jen were called concubines. And I was like, you know what? I'm Chinese. This is fine. But then I like thought about it a little more, you know, beyond my initial impulse. And I was like, you know, I can be Chinese and still indulge Orientalist tropes, right? Just like how you can be a person of color and still harbor racist or, you know, anti-black, you know, or colonized ideologies without even realizing it. Um, and this really came down to a question of, I, I didn't want to push a normative narrative of a, like, grand Chinese emperor with a harem and concubines, which I think is a very common Orientalist trope, you know, this idea of a harem, you know, and is used often to highlight how backwards or exotic gender relations are in the Orient compared to the civilized West, right? Uh, so I decided to change concubines to consorts, um, but the, the change wasn't just nominal. Uh, I modified their cultural relationship with the empire uh, and, sorry, with uh, the emperor herself. Um, that is, instead of sort of like a one-way polygamy, uh, that is often what we think of when we think of concubine, where only the emperor, who's always a man, right, can have multiple consorts, um, and the consorts have to stay faithful to him. Uh, anyone in Long, any consort can be involved with anyone else, and the relationship isn't always necessarily sexual or based on progeny, right? How many heirs can you produce for me as an emperor? It's, it's, it's about um, intimacy. This can be platonic, uh, this can be romantic, you know, it can be somewhere in between as well. Um, uh, and, you know, consorts can have relationships with each other and relationships with people that aren't, who aren't the emperor. This is allowed, uh, and it's very common as well. Um, and again, the emperor here is a woman, and this was an extremely intentional choice of mine. Uh, just because I think strong and powerful women who uh, have villainous streaks maybe are interesting <laughs> to roleplay and think about. And yeah, just because to a certain extent, men bore, men bore me. I, I can't lie, I'm a misandrist. Um, and you know, there's no, there's no uh, structural sexism, you know, misogyny, rape culture. There's none of that. None of that is built into too long or honestly any of the powers, in fact. There are people who are sexist, but they're definitely in the minority, you know, and it's not systematic. It's not structural, uh, you know, and this is very much an intentional choice on my part. I honestly really hate it when tabletop games sort of force their players to role play sexism or sexual assault or God forbid, like rape. Um, I feel like if we're playing a game to get away from that shit, you know, and unless I've actively, clearly, specifically and enthusiastically stated not just my consent, but my desire to explore those topics. Just pro tip, just avoid, just avoid that in general. 
so getting back to Tulong, um, the language of Tulong is a tongue known as Tiu. Oh, this is something else I want to talk about. Uh, languages in Ndake aren't racial. There's no such thing as Orkish. There is no such thing as, uh, uh, literally, why can't I think of anything else? Elvish or Dwarvish, you know, or Halfling. That doesn't exist. Uh, language isn't based on race. Uh, it's based on where you grew up, you know, which is how you can be ethnically, let's say, um, Chinese, but if you were born and raised in German and you've never been to China, you probably are only fluent in German, right? It doesn't make sense. Like if you're ethnically Chinese, you don't come pop out of the womb saying, you know, like that doesn't, that doesn't fucking happen. Uh, so the language here is Tiu, uh, which is a language with many dialects across the kingdom's territories and a uh, iconographic writing system with over 30,000 different characters. Very obviously modeled off of Chinese, uh, which is intentional. Uh, the speech is also just like Chinese, tonal um, and figurative. Uh, so even a minor difference in the inflection of your voice can sort of change the entire meaning of a sentence. As such, this can be notoriously difficult for outsiders to learn who didn't grow up in Tulong or didn't grow up learning Tiu. Uh, Tulongans also tend to speak around a problem. This is sort of how the language manifests uh, socially, uh, seeing it as kind of distasteful to address differences or conflicts outright. And it's it's not uncommon for two Tulongans who are in conflict with each other to sort of speak at length about like an aspect of nature or something without once directly commenting on their issue, but still arriving at a mutual understanding and a resolution through the use of an extended metaphor. Um, so it's very poetic. It's a very poetic language, and it requires you to have a very strong grasp of the language to be able to sort of master it. And as such, most Tulongans, even those who are illiterate, can't uh, read or write, uh, are very well versed, as I mentioned earlier, in like poetic, expressive, and uh, idiomatic turns of phrase. Um, as I continue talking about each power, you'll notice that uh, the attention I pay to the language is almost as much attention that I paid to the other aspects of the powers, such as like their culture or their government uh, or the you know central aesthetics that unite them. This is because I I just think it's neat, you know. And this is another tip I have for you as a GM. If there's a particular thing you think is neat, like if you're a linguistics major, if you're interested in music, right? If you like dance, focus on that. Make the world your own. Have dance be important, or focus on dance as a way people uh, express and communicate uh, conflict uh, and myth and folklore. If you're really into cooking, focus on the food, you know, like what kind of food is, is important to these people? You know, like how is food used beyond just nourishing their bodies? Like, is there a particular way that you can cook a dish and present it to someone that's sort of like, you know, humiliates them, you know, like if I put, you know, Brussels sprouts instead of potatoes into this uh, traditionally potato based dish, does everyone at the dinner table know that I'm saying that the person I'm serving this to, to is a piece of shit, you know, stuff like that. Like, it's, it's interesting to play with the things that you're interested in as, you know, a storyteller and as a creator and really, really dig your, dig your fingers into those specific idiosyncrasies that you have, because they can be your greatest strength. Um, so moving on to the geography of too long. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the brief overview, the Biyan River is one of the biggest landmarks in Tulong. Uh, it sort of originates, you can see the heart-shaped lake of Nepal. It originates from that lake, which is called Ingir Lake, uh, and it bisects the northern part of Tulong. It flows from west to east, you know, and it leaves very fertile deposits along the bank. Um, and many fishing villages, therefore, are nestled along sort of like the lowlands of cup the Biyan River and its dozens of tributaries, probably hundreds, honestly. Um, finally, the God Spine, which is that huge mountain range, demarcates the northern border of Tulong. The Silent Grove is another geographical landmark I mentioned earlier. Um, it's located just south of center in the mainland uh, and to the northwest. The Silent Grove is split into two. Um, uh, Tulong is sort of hedged on both its eastern and western borders by this grove, which is, for the most part, a subtropical forest that has a lot of bamboo in it. Um, and these forests are 
as I mentioned earlier, collectively known as the Silent Grove. Um, and it is widely believed by historians and mythologists that all of Toulon and probably even Nabal and Jukai and Talmud used to be comprised of these subtropical forests before, you know, people came along to settle the land and, and clear it, clear it of the grove. Uh, and these, you, you can see this in, in uh, the rolling hills of cultivated lands that sort of sprawl across the heart of the kingdom that are interrupted by agrarian settlements of hamlets, you know, villages, townships, etc. And the buildings here are mostly, you know, very rectangular, flat, with roofs made of like glazed ceramic tiles and spiraling pagodas that indicate nearby shrines. So that's sort of too long in a nutshell. That's sort of the aesthetics, the culture, the geography. Um, I'm going to take a quick break to uh, drink water and also read the chat in case anything's happening in chat. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Any questions? Ba -ba -ba. I don't think so. Love the water bottle. Great. Okay, then I will take a sip. Um, my good dudes, and move on. Can you hear me glugging the water? Like, glug, glug, glug. <laughs> I feel like a fish. Uh, okay, moving on to the Republic of Talmud. It's that funky, funky little... Sorry, my camera's flipped. That funky little uh, uh, slice of land to the northwest. Uh, and you'll notice that it's split in two, into Northern Talmud and Southern Talmud by the God Spine, which is uh, culturally relevant to it. Uh, so before I even begin talking about Talmud, I want to discuss my inspiration for it, because Zhulong's, you know, inspired by dynastic China. What's Talmud inspired by? Uh, it's inspired by two things. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, I'm a classics nerd. I am perpetually fascinated by the Roman monarchy, uh, the subsequent republic, and then the empire, of course. Um, and I, you know, studied Latin as a language, uh, as well as Greek and Roman history, excuse me, I have this burp simmering in my lungs, uh, for about six years, uh, from seventh grade until, like, my senior year of high school. I, like, took the AP test, I was a huge nerd about it, uh, and we were taught, right, in school that ancient Rome, and of course Christianity, forms the bedrock of Western civilization. Uh, you know, it's philosophy, it's culture, languages, ideologies, you know, when we talk about philosophy, we almost never uh, talk about non-Western uh, philosophers. It goes all the way back to Socrates and Plato, right? That's who we think about instead of like, I'm not a philosopher, instead of like non-Western non people who might have also uh, molded cultures that are not based on ancient Rome uh, and their ways of thinking. Uh, you know, so ancient Rome, and to an extent Greece, is, you know, the foundation of Western civilization, for for better, and most, most certainly for worse. Um, and I could do a completely separate video series about that, but I'm not going to. What I am going to do here is talk about how I've sort of squeezed and twisted and molded what I think is a very interesting period in ancient Rome, the transition from monarchy to republic, uh, to suit my campaign. And then more specifically, create the Republic of Talmud. Um, so the Republic of Talmud is based off of early Roman, the early Roman Republic, as well as broader aspects of medieval India. Uh, so I'm going to open up my little sheet again and talk about that. Uh, bup, 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 bup. This uh, Talmud, Northern Talmud, is actually where our players are right now in our actual play. This is going to be fun to talk about. So the first thing to know is that the god that uh, Talmudans worship is called Yudabati. Uh, and Yudabathi is the three-headed god of mountains and war. Uh, Yudabathi, each, each head sort of represents a different aspect of war and civilization. One of the heads is called Vinash, it seeks to destroy. Another head, Suraksha, seeks to protect. And the third head, Dristi, seeks to create. And those who wage war under Yudabati's banner sort of understand that all three components, destruction, protection, and creation, are necessary for a successful and righteous campaign when you're wa in the sense of war, not in the sense of D&D. Um, destruction sort of clears the way for creation, and creation must be protected. It's sort of like a loop that way. Uh, and because of this, Yudabati's uh, constellation in the night sky resembles a three-headed person with, like, mu with multiple limbs. Um, and when we think of a lot of uh, Hindu mythology, um, 
and religion, there are a lot of, first of all, like a lot, a lot of gods, um, but a lot of them also have multiple limbs, you know, multiple heads, and that's where a lot of my inspiration designing Udabathi came from. Uh, the capital of Palmad is situated at Dabathati, um, and the natural, that's sort of where that, it's kind of hidden because it's, it's orange on yellow, but it's, it's cupped sort of in the god spine in southern Palmad, you can sort of see. Uh, and the natural curve of the god spine in that particular area creates a region of intense rain shadow. And yes, I did like a million hours of research into geography and into how rain rain shadows work. So I hope I hope this is accurate. If there are any you know geography experts out there listening to this, uh, so that natural curve of the huge mountains creates an area, a region of intense rain shadow, uh, right in the foothills of that mountain range where the desert environment is is very prominent. Uh, and within this rain shadowed region, you'll find the rugged capital city of Dabathati. It is elevated 8,000 feet above sea level, and it is a marvel of engineering built into the side of the god spine. The only way to reach the capital of Talmud is through one of the dozens of rope bridges stretching up and over the vast Kagunya Canyon, uh, which boasts a low point of 8,000 feet. Um, and at the bottom of Kagunya, you'll find the god vein, which is a winding, fast-flowing river that originates from somewhere within the god spine, we're not sure where, uh, and ends somewhere in the god spine as well, and we're not sure where. Uh, very few travelers who make it to the bottom of Kagunya, for whatever reason, make it back out again. And Dabathati itself is a mighty mountain stronghold. You know, I talk a lot about how I'm like, I hate it when dwarves are portrayed as mountain dwellers, but it's fucking cool to have a city built into a mountain. I just didn't want it to be d a dwarf-only club, you know? Uh, so that's sort of where some of my inspiration for designing Dawathati comes from as well. These, you know, uh, images, you know, of like, of like, the the dwarven stronghold built into the mountain that has ores inside. I, I wanted to take that uh, and make it my own. Uh, so Dabathati is a mighty mountain stronghold, um, and there are three entrances to the capital, each one resembling an open mouth of one of Udabathi's three heads. Um, and the city itself is similarly divided into three districts. The district of Vinash, destruction, the district of uh, Suraksha, which is protection, and the district of Tristi, which is creation. Vinash is sort of dedicated to matters of war, obviously destruction, and, you know, military. And that particular district houses soldiers' barracks, you know, training fields, recruitment grounds, and, of course, the war rooms for the consuls, which we'll get to. Uh, Suraksha is dedicated to more civilian matters, uh, with the largest concentration of homes, marketplaces, inns, shops, shared public spaces, gardens, etc. And finally, the district of Tristi uh, creation is devoted almost entirely to artists, thinkers and academics, with a high number of libraries, workshops, smithies, supply shops, general stores, stuff like that. Uh, the aesthetics that I really wanted to emphasize for Talmud, uh, you know, is that it's a, it's a diverse, first of all, all of my regions are diverse, but it's a diverse uh, power and it's it's new because this republic is fairly recent and it's, it's raring to go. Uh, what I mean by the republic is fairly recent is just over 300 years ago, Talmud was a monarchy, similar to Tulong, similar to Uhanahi, which we'll get to later this week, uh, governed by a royal family and a very complex system of royal uh, and noble houses. And you can see vestiges of this history remaining, you know, scattered around Dabathati and the Greater Talmud Republic. And they're sort of re reflected in the partition of power and coin uh, that remains in the hands of a few wealthy families and senators. Uh, and the Senate uh, is what governs the Republic, the Senate and the consuls. Um, and the Senate and the consuls are very aware of this. They're aware of the fact that there's classism, right? Um, and they regularly mandate festivals, celebrations, and holidays for the common folk to sort of keep them satisfi satisfied and sort of keep them from rising up. Um, and this is sort of my nod to the um, ploy known as uh, breads and circuses, bread and circuses uh, of the Roman Republic, which is where you get gladi gladiatorial, you know, um, uh, 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 matches, as well as like free bread, you know, like lots of holidays for the people to sort of keep keep them content, you know, like so they could be they could be like, mm, 
like it seems like the senators don't really care about the common people and they only care about the rich people maybe we should uh, uh, revolt and then like the senators will be like have some free bread look at these dudes beating each other the shit out of each other and people will be like yay okay we're distracted um so it's interesting we think about sporting events as uh a way to distract people from uh, forming meaningful political coalitions, but also as a means to sort of vent that sort of simmering chaotic energy uh, that comes, you know, with certain kinds of society where power is consolidated in the hands of the few. Basically like a purge. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the, the culture of Talmud, before I get into the government of the sen of the Senate and the Consul, uh, is roughly divided between North and South. As I mentioned earlier, the God Spine sort of splits Northern Talmud and Southern Talmud. Um, and you can sort of see like the light yellow color as opposed to like the darker yellow color uh, is known, the light yellow color is known as the uh, Jadidan uh, Scrublands. Sorry, I looked at the wrong thing. It's not the Jadidan scrublands. The scrublands are the darker yellow. The lighter yellow is the Torovan Desert. Um, and the darker yellow are the scrublands. Those who live in the, de in the desert often consider those who live in the scrublands to be less cultured than them for whatever reason, while those who live in the scrublands tend to think of those who live in the desert as kind of stuck up and hypocritical. And bef even before the Republic of Talmud formed, uh, there has been tension between those who dwell in the, dwell in the scrublands versus those who dwell in the desert. Um, but the republic, not the monarchy, that came 300 years before the republic was what helped, you know, unite that entire region and like stop outright like bloody conflict and battles from from happening. Uh, so right now, all of Indake, actually, I think this is important to mention, is in a state of uneasy peace. There hasn't been a bloody conflict for probably seven years, and we'll get to that when we talk about Jukai. Uh, and there ha has certainly not been a bloody conflict between powers. You know, all the conflict has mostly been within powers because they have their own shit to worry about, you know? Um, there hasn't been a, a conflict between powers for quite some time, uh, but some is starting to brew, which I think is fun to play with, and, and we'll talk about that later. Um, bup, 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 bup. So now, you know, when it comes to folks who, who dwell in the Torovan Desert versus those who dwell in the Jadidan scrub, Scrublands, uh, they, they now have, like, a, a tenuously working relationship. They're, like, they're, like, very, like, like, suspicious allies of each other, and they trade, you know, but they're, they're not, they don't, there's no, like, full trust yet, uh, between them. Uh, so let's hop right into the government of the Republic of Talmud. As I mentioned, there are consuls and there's the Senate. The Republic of Talmud is governed uh, by both of these forces. It is governed by a Senate of 33 politicians. I might be getting my numbers wrong because I recently changed this. So this, this also goes to talk about how this, this document is constantly evolving. So the numbers might fluctuate but the heart is the same. So there, uh, there's a Senate of 33-ish politicians with three consuls at the head, kind of like the triumvirate, but I didn't want to use the term triumvirate. Um, and each consul, as you can probably assume or deduct based on how I've been setting up this whole thing, oversees a different district in Dabathati and is off also responsible for governing the entire Republic. Um, each consul relies on the rest of the Senate to sort of take care of like the day-to-day -day matters of the capital, while they tend to focus on bigger picture stuff that affects the entire Republic. Ten politicians are loyal to each consul, and the consuls right now are a person called uh, Abramed Rahim, who is the consul of Vinash, which is the military consul. Uh, ten uh, senators are loyal to the consul of Suraksha, which is protection, which basically negotiates trade, civil affairs, the administration of the of republic, etc. And the person who is the consul of Suraksha is called uh, Karisma Bataval. And finally, ten senators are loyal to Hajvaz Sardat who is the consul of Thristi, uh, which governs creation, like art, academics, you know, uh, philosophy, literature, that sort of thing. And the remaining three senators of the 33 are known as the unaligned. They have no strict loyalties to any consul or any district, and they are called upon to arbitrate matters that cannot be settled uh, between the three consuls. 
as you can imagine, there's a lot of there, there there's a lot of corruption, you know, a lot of bribery. Because without conflict, you know, it's not fun. So I'm really looking forward to play with that uh, if and when our PCs eventually get to Dabatati, uh, or explore the major metropolitan centers of Talmud a little bit more. The language of Talmud is uh, a tongue called Talmari. It is sort of it's primarily based off of Urdu. Um, and I'm, I'm not an Urdu speaker. I, uh, to do sort of research into how I describe Talmadi, I just listened to a lot of songs in Urdu and I like typed out a lot of things on Google Translate and listened to it back. Um, but this is by no means like <laughs> accurate at all. Right. Um, and this also, I think opens me up to being called out, uh, in, you know, portraying a fantasy language that's modeled off of a real world language in a way that could be orientalist, in a way that could be problematic. Um, but I want to be transparent with my inspirations. So this mother language, Talmadi, is sort of like, can be characterized as undulating, kind of flowing like a, like a river, uh, where words sort of melt into phrases, sort of melt into sentences, melt into paragraphs. Um, and outsiders might call them run-on sentences, but Talmadans sort of call them poetry. Uh, and there are three, this is something I was really excited to play with actually, there are three distinct styles of Talmadi. There's the informal style, the formal style, and the royal style, which is sort of a linguistic relic of the monarchy that sort of remains to this day to denote the highest order of respect. And to speak in the wrong style is to sort of convey your ignorance of the language, or worse, your disrespect of the person you're addressing. There is a fourth style of Talmadi uh, that scholars like don't want to recognize, but it commonly populates the less economically franchised parts of Talmud, let's say. And this is a style known as subformal. It has a class even lower than informal, uh, which utilizes, interestingly enough, the same honorifics. And Are we back? Great. I'm so glad we didn't have to disconnect. That's the first time I've been uh, disconnected from OBS Studios. So that was a little scary, but I'm glad we're back. Uh, I'm going to assume I was still talking about uh, Talamadi. I'm going to assume I was. I had just gotten to subformal, the subformal class uh, style of language. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up wrap up that paragraph. Uh, okay, so basically those who are addressed by the subformal style are often flattered and surprised because they're like, oh, I'm being addressed in, in the royal style. Okay, this person must think very highly of me. Uh, but if they're not well-versed in subformal, they don't know that they're being mocked. Subformal uses the same honorifics as the royal style, but is, you know, in the way you say it and in the, in the cultural in the context in which you say it, and like certain like linguistic like very subtle markers that you would probably miss if you weren't fluent and subformal um uh it's it's used to humiliate the person that is is being addressed uh with it and this is a form of sort of like double speak that i learned very recently about um that sort of seems to happen in certain Haitian traditions, this idea of like a double meaning to a situation or to a dance or to a conflict that I definitely don't really know anything about beyond that, but I'm very interested in learning about and sort of applying to my world because I think that is a fascinating and super, super interesting and very different from anything I've ever experienced as a Chinese American person um, way of handling conflict and navigating social relationships through language or through dance or through whatever uh, art practices. So let's talk a little bit about the landmarks that are in Talmud. Uh, there's the Badlands, which is where our PCs are right now. That's Northern Talmud. It's that whole um, a light yellow area. So yeah, the Badlands are uh, a special part of the Torovan Desert, uh, the Torovar Desert, sorry, uh, that 
comprise the northern half of the Republic. Uh, and they're, you know, in a way they're largely forgotten about by the rest of Talmud. Uh, not a lot of people live out in the Badlands, and those who do tend to stick to the coastal cities, like right in that little armpit, right, of the court. Um, where there's some semblance of what they would call sophisticated civilization. Uh, and geographically, the arid flatlands of the Badlands are characterized by crimson red rocks, sort of jutting steps uh, and towering buttes. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't cultures out there and there aren't towns out there. They're just largely forgotten about by the mainstream community of Talmud. Uh, and to the south of uh, the god spine I've mentioned earlier is the Torovar Desert. Uh, it's a semi-arid desert that contains sort of pockets of blooming ponds, you know, like gem-speckled mines, uh, glittering salt flats. Uh, there's also like a lot of townships, marketplaces built around these oases with beautifully crafted, very ancient stone temples dedicated to Yudabathi um, that boast like ornate friezes, you know, lintels, metalwork. Uh, and there are, you know, tons of smaller shrines as well that are plentiful and very well funded across all of Talmud. Uh, with temple building, actually, as a favorite project of the wealthy to demonstrate their loyalty to the Republic and to its people, and as a way to accrue favors and power. Uh, and the desert dwellers of Talmud, like I mentioned earlier, they call themselves Tor uh, Torovans, because they, they live in the Toro, uh, Torovan Desert. Uh, the Kagunya Canyon we talked about briefly, uh, the only way to reach Dabathati, uh, Dabathati, which is the capital, is through one of the rope bridges that stretch up and over the Kagunya Canyon. The God Bane we talked about, it's that uh, huge, scary, very rapid river at the bottom of the canyon. Um, the Ujval Mines, yes, the Ujval Mines are sort of tucked deep within the capital city, Dabathati. They're sort of like a legendary ancient mines that have like rich depositories of precious gemstones, abundant veins of gold, silver, ruby, etc., copper, uh, you know, etc. Uh, and there's there's a very high population of miners because of this who live and work in Dabathati, and they're sort of like the lowest class of like uh, hard laborers who toil day in and day out to sort of ferry raw materials from Ujval to the boiling smithies that are located in Thristi, the district of Thristi. Um, and the mines, as you can imagine, are heavily guarded during all times of the day, almost more guarded even than the private rooms of the consuls, uh, because of the, the sheer, you know, abundance of resources that can be found there. And finally, we mentioned already the Jadidan scrublands, which are in Southern Talmud. It's that um, uh, darker yellow portion that sort of bleeds into Nabal. Um, you know, uh, I call them scrublands because they're scrublands. Uh, they're combustible, very, you know, arid, dry scrubs that sort of grow in this area uh, with wildfires and bushfires very commonly occurring. Um, and the people of Talmud, especially those who live in the scrublands, see these fires, you know, the wildfires that occur, as a sign actually of Yudabati's favor uh, because the destructive flames sort of pave the way for new growth, uh, which then must be protected and cultivated by the stewards of the land. And Talmudans who live in the shrublands sort of in terms of their, um, uh, the structures they build, it's in the traditional style, they build beehive kind of huts made of mud, clay, stone, uh, with uh, thatched roofs of straw, you know, dried grass, hay. Um, but, you know, an, an important thing I wanted to hammer home is that they might be perceived, especially by those who live in metropolitan centers, as like primitive, but they are not. You know, in any way, they have their own ways of looking and dealing with the world uh, that are different from those who live in the capital, from those who live in the desert, uh, from those who work in the mines, you know. And I, I really want to highlight that there is a, a diversity of perspectives even within the same uh, country. So that's Talmud. I'm going to take a quick drink of water before I move on and also check on the chat. Thank you for the 15 folks who are here and listening to me ramble. I appreciate it. I know there's not a lot of uh, like political me being like, fuck racism <laughs> uh, as the last episode, but I, I, you know, I like to gush about my uh, homebrew world. Oh no, you missed it. It's okay, the, the VOD will be up. Uh, dang, I just finished talking about the Republic of Talmud, but now we're gonna move on. You, you didn't miss the whole thing. We're gonna move on to Jukai. 
uh, the United Tribes of Jukai. I'm very excited to talk about this this particular country because uh, it is a long boy, as you can see, very long. Um, but it also, well, you'll see, you'll see. I'm, I'm just excited about Jukai. So as I mentioned earlier in my lecture, uh, the United Tribes of Jukai are based on sort of post Sengoku era Japan. Uh, which if you don't know what Sengoku is, it's sort of like a warring states period, uh, where I I was I like, I think that's interesting. You know, historically, that's interesting to me. Uh, so in Jukai, what this means is a period of warring states and of intense militaristic conflict and power struggle has just ended very recently, actually seven years ago uh, from the start of the campaign. Uh, and we're gonna get into that in just a moment. So let me swap on over to my Jukai sheet. There we go. Uh, so, the United Tribes of Jukai worship the god slash goddess, uh, because, uh, because they are both at the same time, Sen. Uh, and the United Tribes, as you can tell, encompass a very, you know, cozy portion of the western seaboard, sort of north of Toulong, uh, and the primary geographical feature here is forest. Uh, wooden houses, you know, with thatched roofs, wide verandas, and interconnected rock pools sort of decorate the ground level of many Jukai, Jukan settlements. Um, there are also, excuse me, pit houses, which are dug very deep beneath the earth, and they sort of provide storage for perishable foods and collect runoff rainwater. Uh, and finally, you know, social outposts like market stalls, you know, gathering places, tribal offices, and sites of worship are constructed in the canopy of trees, uh, connected to one another through a complex series of ladders, ropes, slides, levers, pulleys that require a high degree of dexterity to navigate very successfully. And the god, as I mentioned earlier, is this, this deity known as Sen. Sen claims dominion over nature. Uh, they are the goddess of hunt, harvest, and transformation. Um, Sen blesses the hunters and the harvesters, the predators and the prey, the berries and the fruits of Endake. Uh, and this goddess is, uh, has a very, very mercurial nature. And their nature speaks to the only constant that we really truly have in life, which is change. The changing seasons, you know, the changing weather, you know, the changing tides, the changing forms of animals, the changing, our changing bodies, um, and even the appearance, the appearance of Sen in the night sky, the constellation, uh, changes depending on how you draw your lines between their star clusters. Uh, and followers of Sen sort of interpret this to mean that their goddess's gender is variable as well. I'm very excited about this as a gender fluid person, uh, shifting sort of between man and woman, you know, everything and nothing. Uh, and if you look at their constellation from south to north, it looks like a fox. If you look at it from north to south, it looks like a rabbit. If you look at it like from the side, it looks like a turtle. You know, like it, it depends, it all depends on how you look at it. And as such, Sen's constellation is often depicted, uh, and you know, their calling card is sort of uh, a fox and a rabbit chasing each other, and you don't know who's chasing who, where the chase begins, or where it's gonna end. Um, so before I get a little bit more into these themes of transformation, gender fluidity, and transness, I'll just talk about the rest uh, of the culture first, because I, I really wanna do a deep dive into that. So the capital of Jukai is at a city called Kinongbo, which is nestled between two of the three rivers flowing out of the massive Umaori Lake, which is that like horse, horse-shaped huge lake to the uh, north northeast. Um, Kinongbo, the capital, it, you can see that X, uh, is situated in the Atatukai region of Jukai. Uh, Jukai is, ba is split into three regions, but we'll get to that in a second, um, where sort of Kinongbo deals with long stretches of dry season by diverting water from the nearby Ruku River, which is, uh, you can sort of see that long flowing river, it looks like a leg from that horse coming out of, out of the Umaori Lake. Uh, Kinongbo is the most agriculturally cultivated settlement in Jukai. What this means is you see like terraced fields of rice paddies, uh, perennial vegetables, uh, bright fruit trees sort of hedging the western border of the city proper, which is built on top of a high hill 
overlooking the Ruku River. There aren't any like formal borders, walls, or posts that demarcate the boundaries of Kinongbo. The capital just sort of begins. Um, and there are sort of houses made of wood, cement, and glazed tile that sort of dot the landscape with interconnected farmlands and streams and wells are sort of drilled deep into the hilly soil and they tap into fresh veins of groundwater that almost exclusively originate from uh, Uma Ori Lake, also known as the Three Hoof Lake because it looks like a horse. Um, and as we get closer to the heart of Jukai, Kinongbo, uh, the houses become cloistered together, you know, their verandas, walking paths, and rock gardens sort of bleeding into each other with such interdependency that it becomes almost impossible to tell where one building ends and another begins. And residential homes, you know, merchant stalls, artisans' workshops alike all sort of intertwine. And it's very common here for multiple families from different bloodlines to eat, sleep, work, barter, and make art together. Uh, and the Kinongbo Hill, where the, the, the center of the capital is, is built on, sort of continues to slope gently upward until we reach a flat, gradual peak. And here you'll find the magnificent palatial complex uh, of the Jukai leader, Lord Henka of Oju, the Great Uniter. So the primary aesthetics here of Jukai uh, are hunting and harvesting. Uh, hunters and harvesters are sort of like the linchpins of Jukan society. The more skilled a Jukan person is at hunting or harvesting, the more rapidly they can sort of advance through their tribe, and the more favors are bestowed upon them by the heads of household or the lords who control groups of households. Uh, and young Jukans who come of age must all pass a trial because we all we all love a coming of age trial um that's that's uh that is sort of centered around a, a very hard task of hunting or harvesting and failure can mean several things it can mean mandated social ostracism or it can even mean expulsion from the tribe depending on how bad the failure is uh those who win not just pass but win the trial each year are granted a special personal favor by the lord of their tribe and before you come at me being like this is just like Horizon Zero Dawn. I came up with this before I even knew what Horizon Zero Dawn was. So f fuck you. I, I, I fucking, anyway, moving on. Uh, so the heads of households, you, you'll hear me use this term several times. They're the people who are, it's exactly what you think they are. They lead each household uh, and each, you know, several households comprise a tribe. The tribe itself is led by a lord and then the households are in each tribe and each household is led by a head of the household. Um, the heads of households are typically the best hunters or the best harvesters in their family. It's not always passed down from like mother to daughter. It's not always blood, blood based. Um, and the lords of each tribe are generally the best hunter or harvester in their tribe. So they attempt to be a meritocracy here, but as we all know, um, meritocracies tend to have conflict in them as well. Um, in terms of the culture of Jukai, it is a life of many masks. And this is going to sort of go into my discussion of fluidity of gender, fluidity of hierarchy in just a bit. Oh, thank you for hosting, Erica. Uh, so on par with hunting and harvesting, social maneuvering is also a highly, highly valued skill in Jukai. Children from a young age are taught how to control their facial expressions, how to regulate their tones of voice, and how to otherwise identify ways to manipulate the currents of power flowing between social groups and individuals and even entire tribes. And as such, it's very common for, for various ju jukan, jukans to have multiple names, ranging anywhere from like five to six different names to like over 30. And names are gifted to jukans by parents, you know, it could be a childhood nickname, by relatives, you know, by friends, by enemies, by heads of households, you know, by lords. And each name is treasured on their own terms and regarded for better or for worse as equally important. Um, so this sort of uh, segues us into a discussion about the government of Jukai, which can be sort of boiled down to lords, heads of households, and tribes. So at the very top, we mentioned him earlier, uh, of the political ladder is this person called Lord Henka of Oju, the Great Uniter, to whom all of the tribes of Jukai must regularly pay tribute and taxes. Uh, this is because seven years ago, Lord Henka concluded a successful decades-long military campaign to unite 
the warring tribes of Jukai under a single confederacy, under a single banner. And now it is said that the tribes live in blissful harmony. But is this the truth? We'll get to that in a second. Uh, underneath Lord Henka are the other lords of the, you know, other tribes. Um, and underneath these other lords are the heads of households. Um, each tribe, as I mentioned earlier, is comprised of closely knit familial units, complete with their own unique norms and fam family traditions. And marriages between young adults of different tribes are a very common way to secure alliances, as are trade agreements, you know, and the sharing of favored hunting and harvesting grounds. Sort of toward the bottom of the social order are the, uh, a, a class known as Iransa, or household servants. These are sort of like the workers who manage each family's cooking, you know, cleaning, organizing, tidying, child rearing, and general labor. Iransa are sort of forbidden from participating in hunting and harvesting efforts. Uh, this level of forbiddance varies from tribe to tribe, but it's usually frowned upon for them to participate in this. Um, that being said, it is a common cultural understanding that an Iransa one day can turn into the head of a household the next, due to the constancy of change which is valued in Jukan society. It is not unheard of for sudden turns of luck to occur that might reverse an entire social order within a tribe almost overnight, nor do all Iransa just sort of sit there and accept their fate. Many of them achieve advancement through the tribe by forming close personal relationships with the heads of household. And although power, prestige, and titles, you know, are often, you know, passed through bloodlines, it's, it's correlated. It's not uncommon uh, for a head or even a lord to gift their title to an Iransa that they feel like has been a friend to them. And I want to be clear that when I say Iransa, I'm sort of imagining like the servants who work at you know, Downton Abbey, you know, like they're sort of like in, they have like their own little like, you know, bedrooms that aren't as good, you know, as the nobles bedrooms, but they're paid, you know, and they have their own little cliques and they seem to know what's going on all the time, you know, um, in the house to an extent that even the nobility doesn't. So that's, that's sort of like the, the cultural touchstone I'm kind of drawing upon when I, when I designed Aransa. Let me take another drink of water. I also want to be transparent. I really did not want to f call uh, Iransa a caste uh, or to lean into any idea of a caste system, which I think can be so fraught with Orientalist ideologies. Um, but I also want to be open and receptive to feedback that's like, hey, Connie, you might not call it a caste, but it's functionally a caste. Uh, rethink that. You know, I'm, I'm, open, I'm open to feedback. Uh, so moving on to... Oh, hi, Baba. My cat just, just hopped on. You heard him. That, that was him. Uh, moving on to the language of Jukai. Uh, it is a language known as Jukan. Uh, and it is based off of Japanese because uh, Jukai is based off of pre uh, post-Sengoku era Japan. Uh, and because of that, you know, some of the base ways that ju Jukan can be described can be similar to how I describe Japanese when I listen to it, uh, which is kind of syllabic, rhythmic, uh, phrasal. Uh, populated, this is a difference, I don't think Japanese has a lot of glottal stops, but Jukan does. Uh, moreover, Jukan is intensely like uh, polysemous, which basically, to my understanding, means that words, phrases, and sentences commonly have multiple and contradictory meanings. For example, the word for man in Jukai is the same as the word for woman, which is the same as the word for person. Uh, similarly, the name for their goddess Sen is also the same as the word for nature, which is the same as the word for change. Because of this, Jukans live in a live in a state of constant transformation, as I've mentioned multiple times, where change is regarded as the norm, something to be embraced, you know, and lovingly experienced. Um, and because of this, among all the nations of Endake, Jukans are probably the most liberal and radical uh, with their understandings of identity, gender, and social relations. Uh, but when we talk about social relations, you'll also notice that I sort of laid it out as a hierarchical system, and I want to talk about that for a moment. Um, the transness and the gender fluidity that is embodied through Sen, who is at once male and female, and non-binary, and none of those things, uh, you know, and, and this, this fluidity that is embodied through also the language of Jukan uh, is, is very interesting to me. 
you know, I'm always thinking, how would this cultural norm affect all aspects of this society, you know? And when I was first designing Jukai, I was like, well, maybe one way this can be affected is there is no hierarchy. Everything's sort of horizontal. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to play with the idea of a fluid hierarchy. What would a fluid hierarchy look like where, you know, when we think of hierarchy, we often think of like a pyramid like thing, you know, like a situation where power is consolidated in the hands of the few and there's like a lot, you know, the majority is sort of fucked over by the decisions uh, that that people with power and money make in <clears throat> America, <laughs> Canada, uh, <clears throat> every first world country, right? Uh, but so I wanted to play with the idea of, of can hierarchy be transformative? Can hierarchy be, be, be fluid? I don't think hierarchy in and of itself as a concept, if we decontextualize it, I don't think it's a bad thing per se, though I'd be open to being told otherwise, especially by anarchists and leftists. Um, but I, I'm interested in exploring the permea permeable uh, borders of power. Right. Uh, so the so the fundamental complexity in the United Tribes of Jukai uh, is that this is a culture that is rooted in constant change and transformation, but it's also part of the old guard. You know, uh, as a power. Thank you for following. Uh, as a power, the Jukai has been around for a long time. Uh, uh, you know, they have an advantageous position along the coast. You know, so they can control. You know, seafaring trade. On the eastern border of Ndake. Um, this also means they're away from the central conflicts between Tsulong, Talmad, and Kirtal, right? Which gives them an opportunity to grow their own power without exhausting resources and conflicts against other states, you know? Um, but they also have conflicts within themselves. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, only seven years ago did uh, the warring tribes get forcibly united underneath this one lord. Uh, so Jukai sort of, I'm still exploring, I don't have answers yet. I'm, these are just questions I'm interested in exploring. And that's a lot of how my world building is guided. Not through, quest not through answers, but through questions. Uh, questions that I'm constantly finding new answers to and new permutations of the question itself. Uh, so Jukai comes from my desire to explore the question of transformation and tradition. Are they mutually exclusive? How do they feed each other, etc. Uh, so there is some conflict within Jukai itself, which is some brewing dissent against the Lord Henka Oju, which is maybe like a plot thread that the PCs can pick at later in the campaign. Um, but you know, I, that's that it. That's pretty much it when it comes to uh, the old guard. Oh yes, one more thing uh, before I move on to the Q and A session. I also want to be mindful of time. It is six twelve here going on for over an hour. Um, one last thing I want to talk about is the uh, the conflict going on between Tulong, Talmad, and Kirtal. I know we didn't talk about Kirtal today, but we will be talking about the clans of Kirtal later this week. And a central conflict that's sort of like, like very prominent in the present day of the campaign right now is the question, who controls the heavenly road? The Heavenly Road is a network of trade routes, kind of like the Silk Road, uh, that runs along and across the God Spine, uh, directly connecting Talmad, Tsulong, and Kirtal. And as you can imagine, control of the Heavenly Road is a hotly, hotly contested subject between all three of these very powerful states and a very pressing concern for the various senators, emperors, and agons, who are like the leaders of Kirtal, uh, who are in charge. And commoners are also very concerned with this issue because the state that has the upper hand enjoys better taxes, lower prices, and faster delivery on goods, because that's all that we care about, right? How fast will my Amazon Prime package get here, right? Um, Currently, as things stand, the kingdom of Tulong has the most power over the heavenly road. And this is in large part due to the homogenization of power in a single ruler's hands, Emperor Jens, while the Republic, as we explored earlier, answers to a consulate and a senate, and the clans of Kirtal, as we'll discover later this week, are each governed by a different Agon. So the question is, at the beginning of the campaign, will Tulong maintain its grip on the heavenly road, or will other powers upend it? Uh, and with that, I'm going to just say a little conclusion before hopping into the Q&A session. And I don't know if you can hear my belly rumbling, but I'm also very hungry and I'm excited to eat. Um, 
So my conclusion for this entire section is none of these settings that I've described to you are set in stone. Just like Jukai, they're constantly evolving as I continue to populate them with details, you know, specifics, NPCs, conflicts, cultural touchstones. And, you know, these settings are also malleable in the sense that I, as the primary world builder, am open, I'm completely open to feedback at any time. Uh, and I recognize my limitations as a person with my own biased perspective and my own biased approach to doing research. So I am now going to answer some questions that might might have might have occurred. Taxes is that, is that a question? Uh, I'm gonna open up the. We have like this little back uh, back door channel where where questions are asked. Wow. Okay. Quite a few. Okay. Let's let's dive right into them after I, I take a sip of water. Question number one. Sun's stone, or is it Sun's easy stone? Either way, I love it. Uh, can you elaborate on the political power of Tu Long's consorts? Yes, I can. Uh, I am such, I am so weak for like political intrigue and court politics. Uh, and that's sort of like what inspired me to build this very elaborate system of advisors into too long. So I grew up watching a lot of really shitty, uh, shitty, I don't think they're shitty, very dramatic uh, fantasy court dramas on Chinese television. And there's always like, you know, like the scheming mom of the emperor, right? You know, like there's all these tropes, there's always like, um, like the favored wife, you know, of the of the king, of the emperor, you know, that, you know, the other wives are like, you know, like always like conspiring against, you know, and like backstabbing, you know, and talking, you know, behind their back, you know. Uh, and that was sort of uh, my, my inspiration for the power of the consorts. The consorts of the em emperor wield tremendous soft power. They're like the aunties. Right, <laughs> like they're like the women who, um, in 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 our culture, in in you know Chinese culture anyway, like men still have more influence than women. It's just the nature of sexism. Um, but women women are able to you know like the saying behind every powerful man there's a woman. Uh, that's sort of the power of the consort. Uh, but it's not. It's I'm taking away the gendered aspect of it. Um, consorts can be women. They can be men. They can be neither or both. You know, um, I see consorts as sort of the people that sort of are in the emperor's inner circle that the emperor just enjoys. She likes spending time with these people. You know, emperor Jen. She, like they're her friends. They're her lovers. You know, they're her acquaintances. They're they are both her friends and her lovers. Um, they're who she takes out on dates. You know, and during these dates, which aren't like in the in the tradition of the language of Tu, which aren't explicitly about a political subject, often inevitably end up being. I don't want to, I could definitely use an in-campaign example, but I am going to refrain from it because it relates to one of the PC's backstories that I'm very, very excited to uh, explore later on in the campaign. Um, but basically, it's it's sort of like how I mentioned earlier, too, in, in, in the, uh, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm sort of getting creative burnout. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to do my best to explain this in an in, uh, in enunciated and straightforward fashion. As I mentioned earlier, Talking around a subject is very common uh, in two, and this manifests itself in the relationship between emperor and consort. Let's say a consort has a son that she knows is, is kind of not very good at taking tests, is not very good at taking exams, but is, is particularly good at one subject. And she wants that one subject to be weighted more importantly on this year's exam just for her son. She doesn't care about the effects that this has on everybody else taking the exam. And she's a consort of the emperor. So she might invite the emperor out to tea. They're sipping tea. And this subject of the exams comes up. Without mentioning her son, she might talk around the subjects and try to push the emperor into like the direction of passing a mandate that will make you know the subject that her son's good at uh, to be weighted more heavily in this year's exams. Stuff like that. So consorts, you know, have their own agendas. Every single consort has their own agenda, has their own like stance, has their own ideology about the world um, that they that they, they use their soft power over the emperor to to try to influence. And like they have in a way that 
a lot of court officials don't, a direct line to the emperor, a direct line into her ear that they can try to like actualize through mandates that are then passed on or through the emperor's own like fire you know firing you know firing someone that insulted a consort while she was walking through the courtyard right like any any number of of things like that is sort of how consorts can wield their power um so while consorts aren't like lawmakers in the sense in the sense that they're not like actually writing the laws, sitting down and talking with other lawmakers, they have power in that sense. And there's always infighting among the consorts, like who's the emperor's favorite? You know, even though they have relationships with other people, they know that their relationship with the emperor is in some ways the most important relationship they have, not like in terms of in intimacy or like on an emotional level, but on a political level, right? On a power base level. They're all scheming to be like the emperor's favorite person. Um, so, yes, spy romance, exactly. Yes, so much, like, romantic, political, you know, like, there's so much of that is, is tied up uh, in, in how consorts uh, navigate, navigate conflict and their relationships. So the next question is by, I really do not know how to pronounce your username, uh, Yivniv, Y-V-N-I-V, Yivniv. Uh, is how prevalent slash frowned upon are the worship of other countries' gods within one's own country? For example, worshiping Sen and Long instead of Jukai, or the cult, <laughs> a spoiler alert, the cult that worshiped only Nectus instead of Scott and Nectus in Talmud. That is a fantastic question. I will say it's not frowned upon necessarily, and it is also fairly common. Uh, it's kind of like, I would say it, it depends on the country, but as a general blanket statement, um, it, it's common for there to be people who worship Yudabathi in Tulong and who worship Galtanger, who is the goddess that Kyrians of Kirtal worship in Tulong, especially if like the, the other god is like close geographically. Like, there's a lot of, you know, Talmadis who live in Tulong, a lot of Tulongans who live in Nepal, etc. Especially in that, that, like, central continent. Like, this sort of diversity of thought is, is very common. But the native population, people who were born and raised in a particular area, it's, it's probably, like, I don't want to put a hard number on it, but, like, the majority, the pretty big majority of them worship the god they were brought up to worship. It would kind of be like, um, someone who is brought up Christian converting to Buddhism, uh, the, the degree of scorn depends on your family. You know, like if your family is like, you know, casual Christian, you know, or Catholic, they probably won't care too much. But if they're like hardcore Catholic and you try to convert to Buddhism, they'll be like, fuck no. You know, they might even like shun you. Um, so yeah, I th I'd say it depends on a family to family basis. There's no like huge overarching homogenous way that's frowned upon or like shunned. Uh, and in fact, it's very common for people to bump into people who worship different gods. And I think it's less contentious to worship different gods in the world of Endake than it is in other fifth edition worlds or uh, worlds built off of Forgotten Realms canon or whatever, um, because the pantheon is shared. It is the eight. Uh, they worship a different god of the eight, you know, over the rest, but it's, it's still the same pantheon. And as long as they're worshiping the same pantheon, we're all friends here to a certain extent. Um, uh, the... There might be some fringe people who worship gods that aren't in the eight. Those people... Those people are shunned. Those people are the cults. Or those who worship the eight in a way that is uh, against the mainstream perception of the eight. Like someone who just worships one of the two lovers, uh, which we'll talk about when we talk about Nabal. Or like someone who worships the, just the evil, destructive, you know, like lay waste to all side of Yudabathi. That's seen as not uh, worshipping the other two heads, which is also sacrilegious. Um, what if you don't worship any of the gods? That is the least common. That is very, that's pretty uncommon. Uh, you're seen as very, <laughs> you're seen as apathetic. Sorry, V, you're an asshole to everyone in Nandake. Uh, yeah, not worshiping any gods is seen as very uncommon and disrespectful. Uh, and you're, you're probably gonna be side-eyed. They're like, what? Oh, you don't have a moral compass? Okay then, you know, like it's, it's often seen as a, you know, religion is often tied to morality. Um, so the next question is by Scar Scarlet with three T's, an ager. Scarlet, Scarlet and ager. Love that. Uh, if people travel from one area to another, how can they stay in touch with their gods? That is a good question. I'm going to interpret this multiple ways. The first way I'm going to interpret this question is uh, literally. 
Like, literally, how do they stay in contact if the gods are sort of embodied in a, a, a constellation that doesn't move? Um, so how magic works in Andake isn't, like, if you, the farther away you get from a constellation of your god, like, the, the more your power wanes. That's, that's not what happens, um, uh, necessarily. Uh, so you don't have to necessarily worry about your god leaving you if you're like, if you worship Nitbuza, which is the goddess uh, that Morosans to the north worship, and for some reason you go all the way to Hanahi, doesn't mean that you suddenly are a weaker magician if you're a cleric because of it. Um, so that's something you don't have to worry about. Uh, but when it comes to like maybe like rituals on the road, maybe? That's the second way I'm interpreting this question. Um, it's very common to like carry like an artifact, you know, like some sort of uh, totem that reminds you uh, of your god. Like, let's say you worship uh, a monk, Shinjirdi, you might carry a scroll that has uh, his teachings, you know, etched on it. Uh, if you worship Yudabathi, you might carry like a little figurine of of Yudabathi with you all the time. Um, oh, thank you, Oku, yeah. Uh, you might also uh, have certain rituals that you do, like prayers, uh, depending on the particular uh, god you worship and this is something I would actually, thank you for asking me this question, because I'm actually interested in developing common uh, prayer rituals for each religion. It might be interesting, for example, for those who are very devoted to Meng Zhenjirdi to have a nightly ritual where they pray for good dreams, for Meng Zhenjirdi to bless their dreams, and they wake up and they write down their dream in a journal and they try to interpret it. They spend like an hour every night or like an hour every morning just getting in touch with their dreams as a way of getting in touch with their god. Like, very specific like rituals like that, I think, to, to make you feel closer to your god. And that, thank you for asking the question, because now I'm curious about other rituals I can develop. Um, so I think that's all in terms of questions. Uh, thank you so much for asking questions. Uh, and thank you so much for everyone who came and listened. My throat is getting really hoarse, so I'm going to sign off. It's uh, been an hour and a half, basically. Um, if you like what you know, I have to say, if you're interested in Ndake, uh, watch our main campaign, episode 3, uh, next Saturday, July 25th at 3 p.m. Central on Twitch. Um, for the rest of this week until Friday at 5 p.m. Central every night, I'm going to be having the continuation of the series where I discuss other parts of the world um, with a uh, often critical social lens uh, when I talk about race, orientalism, and colonialism. Um, yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter at by Connie Chong. You can find Transplanner on Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, and Instagram at Transplanner RPG. You can follow me on Tumblr uh, at D and Daddy Issues. Please get in touch with me on Twitter if you want to continue this conversation or learn more. I love getting DMs. I love having conversations with people. Uh, and thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Stay safe. Feed yourselves. Uh, stay hungry. And uh, peace. Bad dreams, you're touching me In my bad dreams, I'm touching my eyes The only proof And I think I still love you As the earth turns just past you